April 25, 2022 is the 30th year anniversary of the 1992 Cape Mendocino earthquake sequence, when three large earthquakes occurred in the vicinity of the Mendocino Triple Junction. The three quakes produced over $60 million worth of damage to homes, businesses, roads, and bridges. Fires broke out in the towns of Scotia and Petrolia. Steep slopes failed in the forms of landslides and rockfalls. Liquefaction occurred along river margins, and the coastline near Petrolia was uplifted up to four feet in places, killing thousands of intertidal organisms like mussels and gooseneck barnacles. Today, 30 years later, the mussels and barnacles have recovered, and the tide pools look healthy again. Join us now on a virtual tour of the Mendocino Triple Junction to explore the most seismically active region in the state of California and to learn from some of the lessons from the recent and the geologic past. Right here is one of my favorite field stops in the whole Cape Mendocino area. We have this beautiful view of the coast, of this flat, and it also shows us something about what is going on here geologically. Back in 1992, after the Cape Mendocino earthquakes, it was immediately noticed that suddenly it looked like we had a low tide all the time. And if you look very carefully, you can actually see outlined in that flat the remains of prior coastlines. This is an area that pops up repeatedly in great earthquakes, most recently in 1992. So we're able to study the rocks here and we're also able to get a better understanding of this entire incredible Triple Junction area. The rocks provide some clues to the secrets of the Triple Junction, but the earthquakes themselves and the science of seismology provided the deepest insights into this region. My name is Bob McPherson and I've been studying earthquakes in this area since 1968. I built a seismograph and brought it down here and uh, found a lot of earthquakes here, three a day almost, uh, unfelt earthquakes. In 1974, Pacific Gas and Electric was asked by the Atomic Energy Commission to find out about the hazards that affect the power plant. And in order to do this, we built the Humboldt Bay Seismic Network. That was Terra Corporation. So the network was about 16 seismographs one of which was just north here, down by the Triple Junction. And the idea was to find out, well, to find out what the tectonics were of this area. And so in the 60s, this idea of plate tectonics was introduced. The idea is the outer part of the Earth, uh, the lithosphere, strong Earth, uh, moves around on the asthenosphere, weak Earth. And these plates are about 60 to 100 kilometers thick. And uh, they move around and interact. They converge, come together, and make mountains. They move apart and make valleys, diverge. And they also are, uh, slide past each other, strike slip boundaries. So here in this region, they're converging. And so we have a lot of tectonic activity uplifting things. One of the things uplifting the most around here is the King Range. These mountains are growing at nearly the same rate as the tallest mountains in the Himalayas, making them some of the fastest growing mountains on Earth. Along the coast, as the mountains uplift, they leave behind a flight of marine terraces. And most of this uplift is due to the northward migration of the Mendocino Triple Junction over the past few million years. The story of the Mendocino Triple Junction begins about 30 million years ago. 
somewhere in the vicinity of what is now Los Angeles. And that's when a ridge first hit a subduction zone and started the San Andreas Fault. Today, the San Andreas Fault ends near the mouth of the Matoll River, where it collides with two other huge fault systems. This is what we now know as the Mendocino Triple Junction. On a map, a triple junction looks like a point where three plates meet. But in reality, it is not a point. It is a zone, a three-dimensional zone, a four-dimensional zone if we add the dimension of time. That is the point. It is not a point. The actual triple junction itself is a diffuse volume of the earth. If you forced me to say where is the triple junction, I think in 1992 the Friends of the Pleistocene did as good a job as any by putting a placard up at uh, AWA campground and, and somewhere in between Honeydew and Petrolia uh, along the Matoll and that's as good as any place. Now that we have a better sense of where the Mendocino Triple Junction is, let's talk about what it is. So a triple junction is where those three plates converge. So the Mendocino Triple Junction is the junction between the Pacific Plate, which is to the southwest, the Gorda Plate to the north, and then the North American Plate, which is lying to the east. Earthquakes in the Pacific Rim tell us exactly where those plate boundaries are. And this animation of earthquakes shows the frequency of earthquakes throughout the entire Pacific Basin. More locally, it shows us the frequency of earthquakes on and around the Triple Junction. Globally, there are uh, probably at least a dozen Triple Junctions. Ours is unique in that uh, ours is sort of onshore, and that's pretty rare to have those onshore. Most of the Triple Junctions are oceanic Triple Junctions, and they occur out in the, the middle of the ocean. Uh, I sort of like to think of the Mendocino Triple Junction is sort of encompassing the area from at least Punta Gorda here up to Cape Mendocino here and inboard at least to uh, maybe Petrolia or Honeydew over here. So this whole area is what we would refer to as the, as the Mendocino Triple Junction. The northward migration of the Mendocino Triple Junction has created some impressive landforms over the past few hundred thousand years. What we see are things like marine terraces that have been uplifted periodically during these large earthquakes. And if you are um, down in Cape Mendocino, you'll notice that there are areas where there are these flat surfaces that may be on the order of a few meters to hundreds of meters wide. And those surfaces appear to be sort of stranded above sea level. And those are indicating times when uh, you basically had some sudden uh, motion that produced this uplift on the order of meters uh, during any uh, given event. And uh, there are suites of these that sit up and some are many hundreds of feet above sea level now. Think of the, the Mendocino Triple Junction as sort of a collision zone or a bumper that's in between all of these. And as you're bringing the Pacific Plate northward it's colliding with the subduction zone and the Gorda Plate that's not getting out of the way fast enough up here. And so that's why we have such a high standing area in the King Range and such, is that essentially things are not able to move out of the way, so they're moving up. And so we have these really steep drainages, we have these really um, steep um, high relief mountain ranges that are there, and that's all a manifestation of the San Andreas moving into, uh, into sort of our area. Today, GPS stations can record plate motions in real time. Changes in direction and length of the arrows reflect the impacts and extent of plate interactions. Here's um, the strong influence of the Pacific Plate Corner in a northwest direction headed toward the Aleutians, and you can see it diminishes as one goes to the east. These crustal deformations and uplift events all happen during large earthquakes. What do we know now about the sources of those earthquakes and their relative hazards? We have five hazards here on the North Coast that we need to be concerned about. And these were all written about in a paper Lori Denger, Gary Carver, and I um, defined them. The five different 
sources of earthquake hazards are the San Andreas Fault, the Mendocino Fault, uh, intraplate, within the plate, Gorder earthquakes, intraplate North American earthquakes, and then the gorilla in the room is the Cascadia subduction zone. With all of these different unique sources of earthquakes, it is not surprising that folks who live around the Triple Junction are well adapted to earthquakes. But what about the people who are new to the area? Families who've lived here for generations understand the need to be self-reliant. Water stored, food stored, they've seen it before, they'll see it again. But over the past several years, we've seen an influx of newer people into this area, drawn by the beautiful setting. They haven't experienced earthquakes or even large floods. We often talk about isolated islands of humanity. These can happen in large winter storms when floodwaters uh, remove bridges and landslides cut off roads, but it also happens in earthquakes. And so it becomes really important to reach this new generation and instill the resilience factor into their lives so that when the next earthquake comes, they and their families will be prepared. We need to understand that one earthquake might not be the whole story, that we have to psychologically be prepared that we could have a number of very strong earthquakes over a period of seconds, of minutes, of hours, or days. And having a better understanding psychologically and in terms of preparing your home and community really can make a difference. Preparing for earthquakes involves certain fundamentals no matter where you are. You need to understand that as soon as the shaking starts, you need to protect yourself and you need to teach your kids to protect themselves. Drop cover and hold on so uh, you're not hit by flying objects and so you are able to fight that urge to run out the door, which is the most hazardous thing you can do while the ground is shaking. It has been 30 years since the Cape Mendocino earthquake sequence. We now understand that these quakes are responsible for the landscape as we know it, both for its rugged beauty and for its potential hazards. We've had many earthquakes since then, and we will have more, potentially even larger earthquakes in the future. It is now up to us to both be prepared and to live prepared.